Alright guys, what's up? Tuba Steve here. Welcome back to Road to Robusto No Limit Edition. This is going to be episode 5. And so last week I did a Hold'em Manager review where I talked about some of the common leaks that I thought you guys might have here in micro games. And today I'm going to be getting right back into it with a two tabling sweat this time. So we had some people that enjoyed the four table sweat, or yeah, I uh, had some people that enjoyed the video review, and then some people that didn't really uh, enjoy either for various reasons, so I thought I would compromise a bit and do two tables, this way we can get live action, and we can also, uh, I'll have a little bit more time to talk on each table. So here I'm going to call with pocket sevens, uh, and on this flop, you know, this is a flop where I expect to have the best hand most of the time, given the board texture, two tens and a six, um, unless he has a ten or an overpair, of course I win, and so he should have a lot of air type overcards. When he checks back here, I am going to bet, because I want to protect my hand and get value, if he does have ace high which is kind of what I expect he might check back here very often. So I'm actually going to bet kind of small. I'm going to bet a dollar. I think a dollar is a good bet size here because I think it encourages some light peels. And that's a great river card for me because I think he's going to call with ace high again. So I'm just going to bet two this time. I bet kind of small on the river here because I want to encourage a light call. Uh, if I had something like pocket jacks, for, if I had decided to flat call with a hand that strong for some reason, or if you know, whatever the situation is, I end up in the same, you know, similar kind of spot, then I would probably bet bigger, you know, because betting is a little bit thin there, and if I do have jacks, I guess there's some, there, there is a chance that he was checking back some pairs on that flop, like sevens, or we had sevens, but like eights or nines or, or something, although unlikely, um, you know, so with jacks, it's a little bit less thin, although, you know, it, may, it might not matter too much. Uh, so here with Jack-10, I would have raised if this guy had not, given uh, that this player limped and he's sitting on about 60 BBs. You know, he's probably a pretty bad player. He fills, or he fulfills both of our sort of uh, screen name tells that you may remember me talking about in the past. <laughs> if, you, if, you don't, if you haven't seen before, you know, I even tried to make my own screen name kind of fishy along those similar lines. You, you can see he's got a, a number after his name. For, for, for whatever reason, it, it seems to be that, you know, fish have the number. A uh, little bit of number action going on, and uh, he's also sitting on 60 BBs, which is our, our, really our biggest tell that he's probably a fish. So hand like Jack-10 there, I expect to uh, actually be ahead of his limping range. You know, it's kind of funny, I did the stove once with some students, because they were like, well, why are we raising Jack-10? And you can actually see that if a guy's limping like 35, 40% of hands or something like that, um, you actually are a favorite against his range with Jack-10 offsuit assuming that, you know, he would raise the, the big pairs and big cards and that he's probably limping marginal stuff. So one thing I did actually when I when I uh, I got on these tables is I wanted to do a little bit of an experiment in a, in a way. So I had uh, I had mentioned before in one of my vids that I thought it was better to look for lower flop, uh, excuse me, uh, lower average pot and higher players for Ugh, I can't talk today. Players per flop. And so I actually grabbed one table on the left that was a, a high average pot and lower player per flop, and then the table here on the right is vice versa. So this is a spot where, you know, it's not super great, but I'm going to barrel him given that there's a flush draw and I could easily have the best hand, and the jack is a scare card. I think I should have bet a little bit smaller. Um, we'll see what happens here. It's going to be a really, really weird spot if he bets. Wow, okay, so at this point, honestly, I do think that he has a missed flush draw a lot. Uh, I'm going to call, because it really doesn't make sense for him to, to, to do this with a made hand unless he hit, like, a boat or something on the river. And so we'll see. Yeah, so that's a really, really, really great spot where the fish's line makes absolutely no sense, and uh, so we can make a pretty sweet ace high call down there. for what he says, because your line doesn't make sense, fool. I probably could call here preflop against him, actually, because he's so bad that I think playing queen-jack in position might be profitable, but we'll let him uh, we'll let him win a pot. <laughs> so this is the type of spot where we want to make a note on, especially, so isolate, ace-9, he check oh, he check called 2x then donk river missed fd yeah a lot of the reason for that is cuz on that flop texture the board is just so low um and and you know since it's paired it's just very 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 few combinations of hands that hit and see now he thinks I'm a calling station which is pretty awesome for me 
because um, he's going to pay me off even more than he already was, or already would have, I guess. So here when I get called on the King-10-4 two-tone board, it's really not a good spot to continue just because there are so many draws. I don't really expect anybody to fold uh, a King here, you know, no way really. A 10, you know, probably not going to fold that often either. When he bets a quarter, I think he <laughs> I think he could easily have a 10 here. I think it's, it might even be his most likely hand. There's no reason to raise though. Um, I'll just take the ridiculous pot odds and hope that my 7 is good. Yeah, so I was right. Um, I could have raised there again. Uh, but I think that his his range is also going to be a lot of just, you know, weird air that he's hoping I'll just fold to a min bed or something. So in the future, now that I've seen that he's done that, I think I would be inclined to raise a, uh, and I'm going to bet the, the eight here. Just so I don't I don't need to give this guy a free card. He checked it to me. So try to uh, protect my hand and win this pot now. Um, But uh, yeah, in this in this spot right here, um, in the future maybe I should be raising this river because you know I actually read his hand correctly and I was hoping that given the odds, you know, it would definitely be profitable because he can have other stuff too. But uh, now that we know that he'll just take that min bet line with a medium pair, if I have a hand that you know th this is a common fallacy I think people have is thinking that certain hands have showdown value when they don't, and so it's actually you know in the future I'll, I would in, uh, I would be inclined to raise there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little tongue tied today. But yeah, so back to what I was saying before. The table on the left-hand side was supposed to be a table where we have a higher average pot but a lower number of players per flop. And then the table on the right-hand side would be vice versa. Um, now, it looks like the table's, you know, about to break on the left, and so we're not really going to get to see. But I guess I was just trying to, you know, I was going to talk a little bit about it as the uh, stats evolved on the table to see if my hypothesis was kind of correct about... Uh, the fact that I think you should be looking for higher player per flop, not average pot. So when this guy 3-bets, you know, if you watched last week, you'll know that calling a 3-bet is something we should rarely be doing anyway, and especially with a hand like this. Uh, I didn't really talk too much about the theory behind it, because you can find that in lots of other videos. I would say watch the Coaching Tree videos, uh, Unconventional Wisdom, Remix, Professor Plotkin. All these have great information about 3-betting, uh, what hands to 3-bet, and stuff like that. Um, Needless to say, hopefully at this point, uh, a hand like 5-7 suited, even though you're in position, is not going to flop well enough to call there. If I was going to play the hand, I would 4-bet, but uh, I see no reason to really 4-bet light hardly ever at 25 and L unless somebody's really playing back at you a lot. So I haven't actually been able to get a lot of hands in recently. Uh, I have been, you know, fairly busy. Uh, but next week I do plan to be able to, or excuse me, this coming week I do plan to be able to grind out a fair number of hands, and I would like the next video to be at, at 50 NL for you guys, so we're going to hope to get that going. Uh, I min raised here on the button because I have queen six student, and it's a pretty weak hand, um, and I just kind of want to see how these guys are going to react. You know, so far the guy on my direct left has been very tight, and so far... Uh, Kobe Sun hasn't played a hand, and he's sitting on a short stack, which means there's a little bit more merit to min-raising to keep the stack-to-pot ratio a little bit larger, which should favor me since I have position on him. One thing, if you guys aren't aware, and this is, you know, sort of a just a general no-limit, you know, type of theory thing, is that as the stacks get deeper, uh, you know, our opponents are going to be stacking off a lot lighter and stuff like that, and, you know, the... You know, something else to realize is that when you are in position, you benefit a lot more when there's a lot more stack behind compared to the size of the pot. So um, you can definitely uh, you know, think about adjusting your raise sizes when you're in position, especially against short stacks, to cause them to make more mistakes and give yourself a bit more room to work post-flop. Now here, you know, I haven't, uh, haven't done anything yet, so I'm, eh, I was going to squeeze, but I think that this run Gomez guy might call, and I don't think he's going to give me a ton of credit. So, well, <laughs> there's my straight, but it's kind of funny, actually. Depending on your action, I think the board comes out differently because of the random number generator. From what I understand, the deck is not really pre-shuffled. They grab one at random, like, during each action. I could be wrong about that, but <laughs> if you ever go on tilt after, uh, you know, folding a hand that turns out to be a winner, you should rest assured knowing that since Poker Sight's random number generator uses your mouse coordinates on the screen to to generate some of that randomness, 
you know, it's pretty hard to rig a, a random number generator when there's like thousands of people moving their mouses in a basically random pattern, right? Um, that's not the only thing they use, but but anyway, uh, I believe it means that if you had folded versus call, that would completely change what card come out or what flop comes out. So um, here, you know, I'm same same logic as before. I'm gonna min raise. And they both fold really quickly, so it's probably going to be my standard play to min-raise on the left-hand table very often. And with deuces, we have a really standard call here. Just try to flop a set, basically. You know, I'm going to keep, you know, playing loose on table one. Everybody's uh, folding a lot, so... 4-8 <laughs> is not the greatest hand, but it's suited, somewhat connected, we're in position, so... If it's four-handed, especially, you know, and I don't think that they're going to adjust very much, then honestly, when I'm playing at low stakes, I don't really even alter my range that much between the cutoff and the button, unless the guy on the button is really aggressive or something like that. Um, again, just mainly because people do not tend to to deal with it correctly, you know. Um, it's kind of interesting. People say that, like, when you're four-handed and stuff, you should stack off lighter, but I think in micro games, you should actually still play relatively, you know, relatively sound poker because I don't think people are adjusting to the fact that it's three-handed, you know. If if I open in the cutoff, a lot of people, even in the, in the deuces cracked forums, will be like, why are you opening this hand under the gun? And then I go back and say, hey, well, you know, it's actually four-handed, so even though we're under the gun, um, we're not, you know. <laughs> You're actually in the cutoff, and so you have to play accordingly, and, and you have to, you know, adjust your opponents accordingly. So that's one thing, I guess, just to be aware of, is, is make sure that, you know, you're not giving your opponents too much credit for thought processes that they don't actually have. And I'd say that's a, one of the bigger mistakes that people tend to make at the micros, too, is is just putting their opponents on uh, too good of hands, giving them too much credit. Um, and, and a lot of that, I think, comes from when you run bad, you are not really, you know, you don't get a, you don't get positive feedback. And I think this is something I might have talked about already, uh, but I'm not, I'm not positive. But, you know, poker sort of eliminates positive feedback loops. Uh, in psychology, you think of, like, Pavlov's dog, where he, uh, you know, you ring the bell and the dog salivates on command, basically. Um, well, in poker, you know, th that's just like a famous psychological experiment as to how humans sort of respond to incentives at the most basic level. And so in poker, when you, you know, you f you're playing against a fish and he shows up with a nut hand, even if you play the hand perfectly, it's hard to tell, you know. And, and likewise, when you're sitting there and you get dealt aces over and over again and you finally get some action, it's hard to fold them. So, um especially if you run good in that spot or something where a fish shows up with a hand like or, or, or with a with a trash hand maybe like the very beginning of your poker career you know some fish check raises you on your turn and you stack off with aces and then you see in the forums everybody's like oh no check raises on the turn are the nuts you know and then, then you get all confused so <laughs> as as I'm wont to do I, I did just go off on a bit of a tangent rant there and in the meantime forgot that I should be min raising that 5-4 suited but um just some food for thought, you know. I tend to do that sometimes. When I think of something, I'll go with it. And uh, really just some, some interesting psychological stuff, I think. Um, and, and one way to solve all these problems is really to just get a good group of poker buddies and post hands. You know, really just can't emphasize enough how important it is to post hands. And if you're unfamiliar with posting hands and uh, you're a little bit uncomfortable, go check out the high school video. I believe Wilton Tilt does a whole video about how to discuss hand histories, and it should be really informative. Because uh, a lot of people say to me, "Is you know, Steve, how do you know what you're supposed to be thinking about in these spots? You know, what's uh, it seems like there's so much going on that I don't even see." Um, you know, definitely check out that video. I think it'll help. So here with King Jack suited, I'm just gonna flat call against him. He is pretty bad. I guess I could three bet, but I don't really think it's necessary. Um, given that I'm suited, I don't mind a multi-way pot. If he was a little deeper, I would feel more comfortable with the 3-bet as well. Okay, and so he checks this flop. I actually suspect that he's trying to trap me, because he is so, uh... He already thinks that I'm full of shit, right? So, I'm gonna check back and hit a gin money turn card, and now he's really not gonna believe me, so it's gonna be totally awesome. Uh, I'm gonna make it 4 here, because that should give me, you know... Actually, I'm gonna make it 350, because that'll give me, a uh, Really easy stack off on the river. Oh, damn it. Actually, I missized it. I should have made it bigger. But he bet for us. I'm hoping that he doesn't have a jack, because that totally would suck if I hit the gut shot and then he resucked out <laughs> to chop. But uh, that's okay. So he folded. Yeah, I should have bet bigger on the turn. I misread the stack size. Um, 
it happens sometimes, and uh, you just gotta learn from it. <laughs> Oh, uh, but what was I saying before that? Oh, just about, you know, reviewing hand histories. Um, it's it's huge, you know, if you can, you know, you have to be able to analyze your own play, pretty much. Alright, so this guy keeps 3-betting. Uh, I have Ann that plays pretty well post-flop, and I'm in position against him, so I'm going to call. Given that he's 3-bet me a couple times already. Uh, that's not a good board for me to... Uh, to really do much on. This is a very interesting spot. You know, I have a huge draw, but when he checks, I think he's just giving up so much that I'm going to try to bet here. If he check raises me, it's kind of gross, obviously, and I'm going to have to fold, but I don't think... Hmm. So he very easily could have something like jacks with a spade here. I don't really see any reason to bet here. I'm not going to fold out any kind of better hand, like if he did check call the flop with a spade draw, especially now he's not going to fold it. Um, if he checked the flop with a queen, he, uh, <laughs> now so he's blocking, it looks like. I really don't beat much here. I'm trying to decide if I can actually raise. It's going to be hard to represent a hand, and I really, really think that he has, like, jacks with a spade here. It's like the hand that makes the absolute most sense, so I'm just going to fold. So I'm going to make a note on him about how he played the hand. So he check called. You know, I, in hindsight, maybe I should check behind on that flop. Um, I was hoping that he was just check folding air, but if he does have air, I'm going to be able to take the pot away on the turn very, very often there. You know, especially when a, a, a spade comes. If he checks it to me again, I'm going to win that pot almost always, I think. Um, of course, he might check jacks again, but... Uh, Still, you know, I don't really benefit much by betting the flop if he does have jacks, if he's going to check it to me again, you know. It's just, yeah, I don't like my bet there on the flop in hindsight. Oh, by the way, I also, uh, I forgot to, uh, to mention, I 3-bet a ace-4 hand against him before, you know, so we are starting to build a little, uh, <laughs> a little bit of dynamic, which is, you know, one reason I decided to flat call the king-jack there. It's normally a hand that you should pretty much fold right away, but he's playing pretty aggro. Um, you know, he could have had some other hands besides jacks there, but uh, I think his line is very, very consistent with some sort of flush draw type hand, um, especially pocket jacks. You know, that's like exactly how I would play jacks if I were him. <laughs> There's no reason for him to check, like, aces or kings with a... with with or... Well, he might check aces or kings with... Of course, we saw a king came, but, uh, you know, with a, a spade, just because he might go for, like, a check... You know, you see, the thing is, if he's going to do that, he's probably going to check raise, or he could check call and try to induce bluffs out of me since he has the board so crushed, but I tend to think that um, people are really not taking that trappy of lines, you know, so... Uh, also, I, I would point out, he could have had ace X there, you know, something... Let me go back to it here. Yeah, he could have had, like... He was, I, I do think he's 3 betting lights, so like ace-10 with the ace of spades. He could check that on the flop. I think most people would bet it, though. Um, so it's kind of hard to say. Fun hand. And so far we can actually see the two tables are relatively tight all across the board here. Um, the table on the left is a little tighter, as I suspected. Um, and this guy's playing kind of aggro, so, you know, eh, I don't know. Besides him, really, no, nobody's doing a whole lot. And actually, am I even looking at the same guy that was 3-betting before? Because it looks like he's only 3-bet 1 out of 6. So maybe I actually just totally screwed up there, I'm sorry. Um, okay, with Ace-Jack against this guy now, I'm going to 3-bet him for value, pretty much. And I'm going to do something here kind of neat. I'm going to bet like a dollar to... Actually, going to bet a dollar and a quarter. And I'm going to hope that he shoves. I'm going to snap call if he shoves. Yeah. Oh, he actually had a pair? Well, I mean, I'm not surprised. He's going to have a pair sometimes. But uh, my equity is such that I can call even if I can 
you know, as long as he doesn't always have pairs there, I'm, I can call, I believe. And even if he does, I didn't actually calculate the odds just because I knew I was going to stack off anyway. But, uh, you know, so we can go back and look at it actually real quick. I had to call four. Oh, yeah, I had to call 410. I'm getting, what, five in here, 10, 11. I'm getting about three to one, not quite three to one. So I'm getting almost the exact odds I need if I can see his hand anyway. So assuming that I, I expect him to shove with a lot of worse hands, uh, my play there is totally standard. Again, you know, we're getting these sort of low flops where our opponents are just so likely to have missed that uh, we can feel confident with ace high as actually being a strong hand. I do think I'm going to check here, just because, again, he's not really giving me much credit, and this is a low, lowish sort of connected board, and I would like to be able to hit my overcards or something. You know, I think he's going to be raising a lot if he has a piece. Um, so I'll check back. <laughs> when he bets 50 cents, I'm maybe I should muck, but given my two overcards, I'm gonna see the turn or excuse me the river. Here we can definitely bet the queen 10. You know, it's a dry board. I'm gonna be attempting to barrel this type of player on certain cards, I believe, just because you know I think he can. Uh, I want to see what he has. I'm gonna call a queen 10 because I'm a calling station. Um, okay, so he did have a bottom pair, <laughs> so that makes sense, and I don't expect him to ever fold that to me. Uh, the way the the match has played out so far. Um, so this is a great card for me to barrel, actually. I'm not going to bet that big, though, because I want it to look like I'm kind of making a cheap stab. Uh, and I don't think I'm really going to try to be playing for stacks here. You know, if he check raises, I have an easy fold. Uh, but this is a great spot. So when we're talking about getting reads, you know, this is the type of spot where you really need to be taking notes, because now we have a read on this player that he at least can sometimes show up with a hand that will call that flop and then fold on a relatively safe turn card. So... Um, let me make sure I get the positions right here. Yeah, he called in a small blind, is that right? Yeah. And I believe this board is what, 953? Yeah. You know, poker's all about adjustments, and so when we see that, um, we shouldn't just keep value betting him. We should also realize that we can adjust by bluffing in some of these spots. So we're not going to get too many opportunities to, to actually use it because he's in position against us. And most of the time when we're barreling, especially at micros, you want to be out of position. Um, people, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny, people don't understand position, but that means that they tend to either like they, they often benefit from position while not even realizing it in a way in, in, in some spots like he's probably going to call down too light when he's in position when he has made hands but that means you can't bluff him you know so it's just again it's sort of a trade-off that you have to think about so I've been playing pretty reasonably for the most part well actually on this table I've been really loose um, there's a shorty behind me you know it's really just not a great super favorable spot for ace 10 under the gun, you know, is, is as you're probably aware from other videos, is not a standard open for me unless I'm playing lower stakes where I think I have a huge edge. Um, and here, you know, there's just not enough spots at the table for me to, to go too crazy. But I am going to re-raise here with ace-queen suited for value. He folded pretty quickly, so I think it's definitely a mistake for him to be raising to a dollar here, given how uh, how much he's been stealing so far. You know, he's just losing too much when he gets 3-bet, and he actually makes it more profitable for me to 3-bet uh, to a similar sort of exact size in terms of stack-to-pot ratio, just because he's putting more dead money in there, and I'm getting compensated a little bit more for it. Uh, and additionally, you know, when, when he does get 3-bet and he wants to call, he can't call as much because of the stack size. Um, it's just generally not nearly as good a situation for him. So I like to delete here with 5-4. I have an open ender, backdoor flush draw. It is four ways, but it's a super, super dry flop, and I think that I could at least thin the field out a bit here, if not take this pot down. And uh, Ace-9, this is a little bit loose, given the history we have with the one dude, but I'm going to bet it. Uh, it is king high, and we are betting into two people, one of whom is a nit. So, of course, neither give me credit. Um... 
which is fine. You know, what are you going to do, right? Move on to the next hand. This guy's short, but he's folded to 100% of steel so far, so I'm going to raise, like, 60 cents. I don't want to min-raise, because I think he's going to call a little more often. Um, but yeah, so what did this guy end up doing? So he let out on a 6. I mean, he he very likely just had, like, a set that he slow played on the flop to try to trap this fish, and then, you know, decide to lead. I think that's a pretty likely hand. He could also be doing that with a king. Um... Given how tight he is so far, I wager when he actually comes firing out the turn into both of us, he probably does have a pretty good hand there. Makes no sense for him to go ahead and bet with, like, a king, even, you know, he would just check it to me again, because our hand looks a little bit strong, at least when we have to, or, uh, excuse me, it should look a little strong when we bet into two people on that flop. But, again, you know, that board is so dry that I think we can get them both to fold quite often. And with the ace-9 against Ron Gomez, you know, if he's going to call me, I might even have the best hand, so not too worried. <laughs> but yeah, I didn't get to play too many hands recently for various, you know, reasons with school, and I've been suffering from some insomnia, which has not made me really feel like I could play my A game. Um, but, uh, you know... Next week, 50NL. I'm looking forward to it. I enjoy playing 50NL quite a bit. I won't lie. I think it's a lot of fun. And uh, should be a lot of good spots to deal with 3-betting people and stuff like that that we can't really look at too much at 25NL just because people aren't uh, aren't really folding so much, you know. And, you know, one thing I am trying to show you guys is, uh, you know, I probably could continue to go pretty crazy down here at 25 NL, kind of like I was doing at 10 NL, but I, I want it to be a little bit more reasonable, you know, I don't, <laughs> excuse me, uh, at 10 NL there were just so many situations where I could isolate and, and bet and take it down and, you know, rinse, repeat. Here it's not going to be quite as much, um, and, and, you know, I haven't really been finding too many great spots to 3 bet, but I have been trying, so I'll keep my eyes open for them still. I would normally isolate here. I'm just going to fold the 10-9, though. Um, I, you know, part of isolating a hand like this, although it is somewhat strong, you know, we, we would rather have deep stacks so that if we do hit a straight or something, we can get paid. And we would like him to fold to C-bets at least sometimes. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, again, some of these hands, or, or some spots to isolate that are kind of thin, you can pass. So I just looked at my overall stats, and I am actually playing pretty, <laughs> pretty loose and aggro. I guess it just doesn't seem like it that uh, that much because of the the stat difference on the two tables. Um, hmm. If I check here, it's gonna be hard to stack this guy when I have a set. So I'm just gonna min raise him. I don't think he's gonna play back. And we'll see what happens here. He may not fold, but. It's a pretty good board to see that, given how much air he should have here. Just with his random crap limping range. Okay, wow, I finally won a pot against him. That's fun. So King-9, here's a spot where you can isolate. We're, uh, we've are we got a full stack, a little bit, little more. You know, it's really not amazing to have more than a full stack here out of position, but... Uh... Hmm, okay, interesting spot here. So, uh, th this is a spot where a lot of people would bet. I don't really think, you know, it makes... A ton of sense to bet here. I'm not going to fold out a better hand than mine. I'm not going to get called by a worse hand than mine. So there's really not much reason to bet. Now th this, once he checks, is a spot where I've been experimenting a lot at the micros with just making some really weak blocker type bets and hoping that he'll call me down with, you know, a draw or, or some high card or something like that. But when he instant check back on the flop, I don't think he had much. Um... Hmm, now, <laughs> see, this is what, you know, part of the reason why I do this is because I don't think it's going to induce a lot of stuff, but 
uh, I kind of do here, and so I don't think he would raise a draw, really. So when I hit this card, I think that unless he has, like, a set of fours or something, my hand's probably good. Oh, I might be a calling station, but I don't think that it really makes sense for him to show up with a queen here. Um, yeah, total air, so I can do something. I gotta say, it's a little lucky that I hit that king, just because... I don't think I would have had the balls to call it off if I didn't have two... P <laughs> Everybody thinks I'm a fish. See, it's so awesome. Um, I don't think I necessarily would have had the balls to call it off if uh, I just had a nine, even though it probably doesn't actually change my relative hand strength, um, you know, at all. How do you call that? Because his line didn't make any sense. That's how I call it. Here I'm just betting real small because it's so dry, and I'm hoping to, again, induce something... Snap call the river. <laughs> oh, see, it came back to bite me in the ass, finally. He peeled with a backdoor flush draw and hit on the river. Again, I, I have no problem with my play there, though. You know, whatever. <laughs> he's gonna... If he's gonna peel me with jack five, you know, he's gonna make even worse mistakes when he hits a jack or a five. So... Which, should say, it's definitely more likely... <laughs> So I got the best of him early, he's getting the best of me, and then losing his money back to everyone else, which is unfortunate, but I do have the quote-unquote Jesus seed against him. And, uh, you know, if I was playing normally, you know, I might consider leaving. But I think that it's actually cool for me to stay on these tables with some tougher guys, just so that you can get a bit more, uh, more knowledge that way. Mm, interesting. This guy's folded to a lot of steel so far, so I'm not going to raise too big. Um, I don't really expect him to be able to outplay me that well from the big blind. You know, so uh, against better players, I might raise to 4x there, just so that I can sort of tighten up their calling range. Um, against that guy, I'm not worried about it. Again, like I said, he's folded a lot, so... Hmm. Pretty interesting spot. I'm going to bet uh, flop and turn here and then sort of see what to do on the river. I was actually kind of considering checking back here, but I think it would be a mistake. Uh, See, this is the reason why I was thinking about checking back, because if you get check raised, it's pretty gross. And, you know, honestly, I'm not even going to call this just because what, what am I hoping that is going to happen on a later street? You know, I'm basically hoping that a blank peels off and then he checks and then I can either value better, get to showdown or something, right? But but against his range here, even his draws have me crushed. You know, um, there, there's no good reason to continue here against this guy. He has been somewhat aggro, according to the, the aggression frequency, but his check raise flop so far is zero. So it's just so much more likely, especially in that middle connected flop, that he has something like uh, pocket nines than like 9-8 suited. And even if he does have 9-8 suited, well, I guess I have an 8, so I have a blocker. But, um, you know, he's still got really good equity. And uh, and against his overall range there, I think I'm pretty cooked. The reason I elected to bet after thinking about it a little bit is because there were so many draws. And at these stakes, I still expect people to mostly play draws passively. So, you know, if you thought that some guy was going to check raise this flop a lot with, say, draws and sets, and if especially if he was good and you thought that his range was balanced... You know, sort of the whole point of him having a balanced range in that spot is it makes it impossible for you to do anything correctly. So, if you think he will check raise a balanced range, you should check back. Uh, at least, that's what I, my understanding. <laughs> um, 
and that's what I've been doing. Again, I don't think about, you know, I've mentioned before in my videos, I really don't tend to think or talk about balance too much, because I don't think it matters too much, but it's a useful concept to, to consider when we should and shouldn't do things. So, uh, when he checks back that flop, by the way, you know, he probably just has nothing. Um, I'm not going to make a super detailed note, but, uh... Just the note that he will give up after checking the flop, you know. It's a good note to have. So we'll see if we can finish the job here with the ace-10, or ace-jack, excuse me. And uh, if we keep flopping, you know, aces, then I don't think we're going to have to worry too much. Here, again, I'm going to bet, I'm going to bet a little bit more reasonably because of the draws. I'm going to bet half pot. Um, again, over against his whole range here. <laughs> again, if he, if he has a flush here, you know, I'm just running super bad against him because he's going to have an ace here and some other stuff a lot too. Um, and given the pot odds now at this point, I'm never folding. Yeah. Oh, 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 okay. So he actually had a straight. So, you know, of course every draw gets there on the turn. And again, you know, I'm running pretty bad against him, but I think he'll show up with an ace there. You know, this guy, sh again, should be doing plenty of crazy stuff. So, you know, good for you, bro. You keep sucking out on me. He's going to call a bigger bet with those drawing hands anyway. So the fact that I, like, gave him correct pot odds to hit with the draw doesn't really concern me because I don't think he plays those hands any differently, really. And so against his whole range, I make more money by uh, by inducing or attempting to induce some weird stuff. Um and again, you know, looking at stack to pot ratio and just his total range being so many hands, the, the odds of him having these draws every single time are very infrequent. And so, uh, you know, I think it's actually kind of good that this is coming up just to show you guys that we ought to try to be objective. We ought to realize that, you know, it's easy, it, you know, it's possible to run bad. And especially when we're short stacked against these guys, there's a lot of variance. And so, uh, you know, at least now we got a full stack against him so we can try to play a bit more normal poker. Um, and, you know, he should be plenty willing to give us his chips still. Just a matter of time. He actually has taken so many pots off me. It's just him that I'm back to close to break even on the session now. <laughs> Which is not something that you really ought to be keeping track of, so maybe I'm promoting bad habits, but, uh... I don't know, it's interesting to know for the viewer out there in internet land. Something I just thought of that I meant to uh, to mention and it actually is in that hand where I just doubled him up. I should have bet slightly. I think I should have bet slightly smaller on the turn just because I bet basically half his stack. And so I, if I am ever going to get him to induce some stuff, uh, it's a, you know it's a little bit better to bet smaller there. Uh, King five suited all raise here, been kind of kind of quiet um, on this table. I feel my numbers have gone down a little bit from the 40s to the 30s. So I got a <laughs> oh, see, that's what I get for not paying attention. Is uh, this guy with a 275 stack is definitely uh, definitely a spot to fold here, given the uh, the stack size and the, the bet size. Um, and when this guy bets a quarter, you know, I, I don't really like raising, especially with a short stack in the hand. So I'll just call, try to pick up a draw or something. Um, you know, that's really not a bad card for me, just because combinationally or combinatorically speaking it's unlikely that he has, or it's a little less likely that he has a hand now, just because there's only one jack left, but, you know, now that he's making a more reasonable bet, you know, it, I'm getting great odds, but I still just have a king high, so. 
Oh, wow, and so he was betting with ace high. Um, kind of worth noting. <laughs> Just make a little note about him so that I can uh, be aware in the future when he starts making these little weak bets that it could easily be air. Okay, so with sevens is a pretty interesting spot. Um, I definitely like checking here to see what Mr. Peepers does. I'm hoping that he's going to check, basically, which would mean that he has uh, nothing. Uh, the standard line here, I would say, would be to check call once and then check fold the turn, simply because I don't think he's going to barrel that often. Now, one thing I would say is that when a queen comes here, you know, like an overcard, and it's like a really dry flop like this, um, hmm, I wonder if I can get him to bluff me on the river. Considering betting, I'm going to see if he'll bluff me. Um, I don't think there's much he can call with. Okay, so it makes no sense for him to check the turn with ace-queen. And this is a problem that I have sometimes when I'm playing micro stakes is that people make stupid plays and, uh, I'm not able to put them on those hands. I mean, he should definitely value bet that turn. I mean, against me, it's probably an, <laughs> an okay spot to check, but against just about anybody at 25 NL, he should be betting the turn with any queen. So I guess that's my mistake for, you know, thinking that 25 NL players would bet a queen there on the turn always. But again, you know, when I call that river bet, I don't have to be good... How much did he bet? Like three quarter pot or something like that. So I only need to be good like thirty percent ish. Yeah. So I think my call there is still fine. The board again, it's so dry. So if he doesn't have a queen, I win. And uh, I think it's very likely that he 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 just has nothing when he checks quickly on the turn there. Um. Hmm. It is a weird spot. It doesn't really make sense for him to be bluffing on a board like this because his range is so narrow. But given that, you know, I just paid him off on the last hand and he probably thinks I'm a calling station, I doubt he's going to be trying to bluff me here. Basically, oops, keep clicking the wrong thing. Basically, when he checks here on the turn and then bets the river, I don't think he ever has like a pair worse than queens because I think that people with eights, nines, and tens and jacks are gonna just check back the river here almost always. Um, especially in hindsight, if he's not, uh, you know, <laughs> loose enough to uh, to bet a queen here, he's definitely not gonna bet you know tens, right? So. It's hard to say whether or not he, he didn't realize that he could get value or if he was trying to induce something. I think it's most likely just, you know, he's probably not on a super high thought process and that, that he just wanted to get some value, but, um, or, uh, excuse me, that he just wanted to uh, play pot control and didn't realize that he could get some value. But again, just to recap, when he bets the river there, I think his range is basically polarized to queen x or nothing. Uh, and there are since on this particular board texture, there are so many ways that he can have nothing. I decided to call, and he showed up with ace-queen, and, and that's okay, you know, but, uh... Also, just since, you know, the pot was three ways, um... I don't know, I was kind of expecting the value bet, uh, or to, to value a hand like ace-queen a little bit more when he hits it on the turn. Meh. Oh, well. <laughs> I would say that's the hand that I'm the least happy about as far as all of my little light call-downs have been. The rest of them I definitely think are okay. That one's the only one that I think is really kind of been questionable. I guess there was another one that I might have mentioned before. Um... Oh, did he just get stacked? Is that what just happened? Uh, the guy hit a flush draw on him. Or a straight draw. Or did he hit a flush? Did he backdoor flush? Yeah, he backdoor to flush. 
So, uh, Ron Gomez has no chips. That's sad. Um, <laughs> he was definitely the spot. And uh, most of the chips we lost on this table were to him, which is not really important, but I'll allow myself to be a little bit bittersweet since it's just 25 and L and it's not my normal game. <laughs> Normally you want to try to eliminate those thoughts as much as possible because it just causes tilt, but I'm not going to tilt at 25 and L. Well, actually, I don't know. I'll let you guys be the judge of that <laughs> as to whether or not that seven sands was tilt or not. But I think that, you know, based on my hand reading, uh, it's all right. And now I would just have to adjust my uh, my play against him. So the 9 is an interesting card. I mean, if he did decide to call me on this flop with, like, pocket 5s, he may fold now. Um, <laughs> is this guy... Is he looking the other dude up on table ratings or some poker table ratings? Uh, but, but uh, excuse me, but the 9 really, in general, you know, besides that, it's just not an amazing card. If he checks, I think I am going to bluff, though, just because I can rep a 10. I wouldn't be surprised if he called me with like a 7 or something anyway, that he was slow playing, but... People see this board texture. You know, my bet here doesn't need to work that often. I'm betting just over half pot. So I need him to fold like 42-ish percent of the time or something like that if I did the math right in my head. Two-thirds pot is about... Actually, two-thirds pot is about 40%, so... Um, I'm so bad at calculating the exact numbers in my head at these stakes because it's not whole dollar amounts. Uh, but there was four in there, and I bet two. Yeah, that's two thirds. So. All right, guys. Well, since that fish left, and uh, we've definitely gotten into a lot of good spots today, we're gonna go ahead and uh, uncheck the auto post here and start wrapping it up. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this video. Uh, any questions or comments that you have, please put in the thread. I'm trying to see if there was anything else that I wanted to mention real quick before I go. And I don't really think so, you know. Um, oh, I'll give another shout out to uh, Tecmo for doing the Deuces Crack University. If you haven't seen that yet, check it out. Um, it's in the secret headquarters, and it's basically... He set up a, a little mini What Would Joe Tall Do-esque quiz for my series, where it's, you know, pretty pretty small, um, you know, ace-ten offsuit here. This guy hasn't three-bet at all yet. Easy fold. Um, excuse me. Uh, there I go, losing my train of thought at the end of the video, but well, I guess it could have happened earlier, so better end, better at the end than before. But, <laughs> but still, uh, he's doing the Deuces Crack University. It's a secret headquarters group. Quizzes, like Joe Tall... Um, they're shorter and kind of basic, you know, but the idea is just to get you guys uh, to watch the videos and understand the general concepts, and uh, then we'll, you know, you can discuss whatever's going on, um, you know, in the more complex hands and the forums and stuff. And I am donating a free coaching session to the winner. So, if you want to get a free coaching session, uh, and in fact, what I might do, I just thought of this, so don't quote me on it, but I might record it and upload it as a ninth sort of bonus video. Assuming I get the go-ahead from Krantz and all those guys, which I don't really suspect will be a problem. So, uh, oh, and next week also I will be bringing you a... Uh, that's the last thing. I will be bringing you an update with some hands. I'm going to try to grind and get at least, you know, a few thousand more 25 NL in. It's been a lot more difficult than I expected, but uh, either way I will be able to... Uh, I will be planning to do some 50 NL action for you next week, even if I don't, you know, unfortunately, you know, some 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 people have mentioned that I haven't quite been sticking to the road to Robusto in quite the same way that Rob did in his original Limit Hold'em series, for which I do apologize, but I'm trying to basically, you know, I think, I think, and if you disagree, I apologize, but I think that it's more important that I get the best sort of uh, information to you guys as I can. You know, a little bit more important to do that than it is to 100% adhere to the theme. Uh, but that said, you know, it's I'm, I'm doing my best with with what I can do right now with my time constraints. I have a lot of coaching commitments and school and uh, 
and all that good stuff. But, uh, again, you know, I'd like to thank you guys for watching. I'm having a lot of fun making this series, and I hope you are having a lot of fun watching it. So, for everyone here at DeucesCrack.com, this has been Tuba Steve, and I will see you next week. Hope to see you in the forums. Thanks, guys.